Oh, no. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Tree Health Focus event on Oak Procession Remoth. Uh, we've got a brilliant speaker today in the shape of Andrew Hoppitz. And our format today is Andrew is going to give his presentation and then you can use the Q&A function. If there's any interesting questions, we'll be reading those out. Um, for those of you who've not been to a Teams Live event before, it's slightly different to the format that you might be used to in that the Q&A function is there, but there isn't a chat function. So if you've got any questions, if you put them in the Q&A box and myself and Millie Toft, who's also on the call, will try and answer those for you. Um, if there's any popular ones, we'll publish them. And if you like them, then use the like function and then the most popular questions will be read out for Andrew to answer after his presentation finishes. So you should have a box that looks like that. So if you use the ask a question button, you can put your question in there. So without further ado, I am going to finish my very, very brief slideshow. And we are going to hand over to Andrew. Can hear you, Andrew. Right, can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. And can you see the presentation, Millie? Yeah. Okay, right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, my name's Andrew Hoppett, and I work for the Forestry Commission, leading on a program uh, on the control and uh, surveillance of oak processory moth. Um, I suspect we've got a, a wide variety of wide variety of uh, uh, folk on on the call, so I'm going to go through uh, some of the history and the life cycle of opium before then giving you an update of of the current situation, both in terms of of policy and actual physically where opium is and what we'd be doing in the uh, in the coming season. Sorry, Andrew, just went on mute. <laughs> Oh, the technology is obviously making me uh, fail dismally. Is, can you hear me again, really? Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay, right. okay, so where did uh, oak processionary moth come from? Well, it was first seen in 2006 in uh, southwest London area. Um, and this was actually on trees which were imported uh, to do with the housing development. Um, and the trees were actually planted in 2005, so it's been, you know, within within England uh, since then. Um, it actually came from a supplying nursery in the Netherlands, but that nursery was actually, was then supplied by uh, some trees in in Italy. So you can just see how plant trade has uh, has been very instrumental in getting oak procession within this country. I'll be calling it opium from now on, by the way. And there's been a slide maybe you know, halfway through my presentation, which is going to give you further understanding of the difficulties there are in controlling op opium because of, of, of uh, imports into the country. So first off, um, the life cycle of, of opium, and it, it, it's, a, it's a one year cycle. Um, and, and the reason why we're doing this talk uh, at, at this time of year is actually we, we get to the stage where opium is about to emerge from from egg plaques. So uh, the egg plaques are on the trees from late August, September, all the way through to March going into April. And then the caterpillars emerge. They're very small to start with, maybe one or two millimetres in length. And they go through six stages of development, what we call instars. That's where the caterpillar sheds its skin, its cutin, um, and it does that going through to uh, well June or July, where it then turns into a chrysalis, it pupates, and then for a few weeks it stays there before it emerges as a moth. The moth flies, breeds, and then the whole cycle starts again. The moth doesn't have any feeding parts, so actually it's the caterpillar which is the concern in terms of uh, why we are why we're doing a, a management program on on opium. So this is what the egg plaques look like: uh, very small, two centimeters in length, maybe about 200 uh, plaques on on a twig the size of your little finger, 
Um, and research suggests that maybe 90% of those will actually um, emerge. So the picture on the left hand side is actually the catamas that have emerged um, and you can you can see actually they've emerged before there's anything for them to feed on. So the, the, the oak buds are still quite closely, uh, still haven't um, burst their bud. And one of the things that we do do is work with partners to find out when opium does actually emerge. And so um, Raw Parks, a big shout out and thanks to Julian Johnson and her team um, at Richmond Park. But also I work closely with um, a, a colleague in the Netherlands, a chap called Henry Cuppen, um, to get an idea of when caterpillars are emerging. So the earliest it's ever appeared is actually the 21st of March, and that was in 2014. And the latest was um, in April the 16th in 2018. You may remember that year, that was the year when we had the beast from the east. Last year was actually quite late, 14th of April. But I mean, we're going for a very mild, mild spell at the moment, and I'm, I'm expecting a call from Julian or Henry soon to say actually they have observed the caterpillars emerging. The caterpillars are quite clever in that they have a mechanism where they can go into a torpor waiting for the oak leaves to appear. Um, that's rather important because if you look at this picture here, this was taken uh, in Alexandra Palace on the 16th of April last year. Uh, the picture on the left hand side is very clearly uh, an oak tree that has burst bud and it's, it's forming leaves, maybe 60-70% canopy cover. The picture on the right hand side, there's some oak trees in the background which haven't burst bud, so you can see that there's a, a challenge for the caterpillars as to when they should actually uh, emerge, but they they have this mechanism where they can go to talk for two or three weeks uh, before they need to start feeding. This also has an impact on when we do control using spraying techniques because we need there to be oak leaves in place for the caterpillars to eat the chemical before uh, control can, can happen. So the caterpillars go through these stages of development um, and this is what they look like when they've gone through to about their third stage and they're starting to get this rather gregarious nature, they're coalescing um, um, and then they start to move around the tree shall we say um, and this picture was taken um, at a place called Pembroke Lodge in Richmond Park and it's it just shows you how the caterpillars can be anywhere on the tree so there's a, a pound coin there for scale, which um, Millie's holding. Um, and you can also see at the very bottom of the picture, there's caterpillar frass. So this is something to be aware about, you know, going from late May onwards, it's very easy to start getting close to these caterpillars without, without really realising it. So if you're in an area with no OPM, just be aware of, you know, touching oak trees anywhere because they could have these caterpillars on them. And it's from about the stage three going into stage four that they get these toxic hairs, which obviously you've got to be careful about. So here's a close up of them um, at stages maybe five going into stage six. The long wispy hairs aren't actually the problem and I'll talk about the uh, the uh, the issues there are to do with human health a, a little bit later on. But they've got this rather distinctive black stripe. Um, there are there are lots of other hairy caterpillars. My general advice would be, to, if it's a hairy caterpillar, just, just don't touch them. OK, and these are uh, a couple of pictures of why uh, opium gets its name. Millie took the picture on the left. Again, this is at uh, Alexandra Palace. And, and this is not, no, this isn't maybe a typical procession. It's, it's, it's a single line, uh, but also you're starting to see this webbing on the, on, on the trunk of the tree. And the picture on the right hand side is is where there may be two, three, four abreast. And again, that's maybe a more typical procession um, uh, where, where they're, they're essentially going up into the canopy of the tree at, no, at night time to, to do the foliar feeding, then coming down and then they start to, to, to form nests. So, I mean, the picture you're seeing on the left hand side is the, the classic uh, white nest which actually is, is not typical, that, that will soon discolour. But what you're seeing here is, is that they've got this very dense webbing and then they're going up and down the tree to feed and you can see the silken, the silken thread. So that's a, a classic to look for. If, if only it was only as easy as that to find opium. 
picture on the right hand side is when it's starting to discolor. This is uh, from a forest research colleague called Max Blake, uh, entomologist. And again, you can see that it's it's got this rather dense webbing starting to get the same colour as the actual oak tree itself. And that's when it starts to become more challenging to see, see, see the, uh, the, the nests themselves. OK, and the nests, well, what, the, the, the nests can be really any size from maybe a golf ball up to the size of a rugby ball. Rugby ball. So, so the one on the right hand side is very large and you can also see in the background some foliar feeding so there's you know, significant defoliation of the oak tree there and also the picture on the left hand side gives you an idea of where opium can actually start to form nests and also where they can pupate so so this is where they're starting to get very close to the ground so you know one has to be careful with you know inquisitive animals like dogs when you've got opium around because you know that you do hear of some horror stories of, of dogs sniffing nests and you know getting you know, badly affected by them. So this is what a cocoon looks like. Um, not really much to say here. There's often you think you're often seeing caterpillars around and this actually it's, it's almost certainly to be the shed skins of opium, but they can have the toxic cows on them. So be very careful if you do come across one of these nests. They can be, as I say, anywhere uh, on the tree. Um, and so just be aware of that. And then you almost certainly won't actually see the moth itself. It lives for maybe one, two, three days. It's a little brown job. It's strongly attracted to light. Um, uh, we have a trapping program, well, well, um, so better, to, better to call it a monitoring program using pheromone traps, which actually only capture the male moths. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the pheromone monitoring program um, because we, we, we're doing a much wider network of that going through this coming season, especially in something what we call the pest free area. Um, it's about two and a half centimetres wingspan wide. The, the, the pictures on the left hand side are male and female. The female is the bigger one, and uh, but actually doesn't seem to fly as far as the male. Males have been observed flying over 20 kilometres, whereas the female tends, tends to stick to the tree. It's actually emerged from or normally within 500 metres. However, that being said, we do occasionally get, you know, exploratory females um, and, and the average rate of spread we've noticed with OPM. It started actually quite quite small, maybe I don't know, two kilometers from 2006 to 2013. And the average rate of spread now seems to be about seven and a half, eight kilometers, maybe five miles a year. So we've got new websites uh, which are up and running, uh, giving information on, on OPM. Now, I spoke to Caroline, this presentation will be turned into a PDF and I think Caroline will be sending this as a link. So there's no need to jot down any notes on this, um, but but these are the links where uh, to, to get more information. We try to keep these as up to date as we possibly can. So what do we actually try to do? There's, there's, there's five um, aspects we try to we were trying to limit the spread of opium and reduce its impact on tree health and also people and animals. Any new findings that are found, uh, especially in the pest area, are, are dealt with robustly. And we actually have a range of control activities to help us do that. And that's through surveying, control and, and a comms package. We also do research or provide operational Aspects. So, for example, I'm working with uh, the Food and Environment Research Agency, looking at maybe methods of pheromone um, disruption to try and, and limit the spread of opium, but also keep on building partnership with uh, with with, with uh, um, you know, major landowners, but also engaging in, in activities such as what I'm doing now. So there's there's really five pillars to what we do. We we, we look for OPM, um, and actually that, that pretty much goes on all year. And uh, there's reasons for that, which I uh, so so survey can be done at any time. Um, and actually, we've, we're just coming off the back of a large winter survey, which has extended our knowledge of OPM. 
There's a control program, mostly through um, spraying of a product called Bacillus thuringiensis. There's also an awful lot of data behind what we're doing, and we're, uh, we'll have a contract with Southampton University who provide the support on that. We do a lot of research and gathering evidence, um, and there's obviously comms and, 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 and materials to, to, to help uh, with the program. So here's a, a history lesson of OPM. Um, I've tried to represent the spread in the southeast by those um, lozenges, so to speak. I need to get the 2021 extent put up, but we're just gathering that information now. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'll have that ready for some awareness events that I'll be doing in June. Um, but also what you can see is there's lots of dots all over England, but also a few in Wales and Scotland. Those green triangles are re actually representing a significant of, of, of event that happened in 2019 where we, we started to find lots of opium being imported on instant trees, mostly linked to housing development. But we've also had um, introductions in places like Sheffield, uh, Leeds, uh, uh, Royal Wharton Bassett, uh, Whitney, Oxfordshire. Um, What's interesting about all of these introductions, what we call interceptions, is we seem to have actually stopped them all, but it took a phenomenal amount of research uh, and evidence gathering to actually find all of these sites. There was over 2,000 lines of information, so 2,000 sites were looked at in 2019, which generated all of these findings of opium. So that's just really giving you a, a close up of, of, of the extent of opium. The, the this turquoise line here is not up to date and um, the extent has actually changed uh, for the digital vote opium from our winter survey work. So we have actually a publicly accessible map for where where opium is and and I'm going to try and you explain the concept of, of the geography. So there are three areas which have different policy approaches to them. So, so the majority of Britain is what we call the pest free area, and that's where we will be eradicating opium. That's that's clear policy. And that's what we were doing in 2019. We then have an area called the buffer zone, and that's um, that's uh, that's an area where we are trying to slow the spread of opium, trying to reduce the footprint. And, and there we issue things called statutory plant health notices. Then finally, we have the established area. That's where we know opium is. And that's where we're, we're giving tools to landowners to make decisions themselves as to what they should do with, with opium. But also we've been trialling a pilot for residents in that we will be helping some residents uh, with, with the management of, of, of opium. So the pest free area um, it used to be called the protected zone. Um, and so last year we had 69 sites dotted across Britain um, of uh, 1,655 trees. Each of those sites had 24 trees, which we looked at opium. We could find no evidence on those sites. Um, but what's interesting is um, the thought processes are we have international obligations for reporting on pest free area status. And I work closely with a lady called Sam Grant in DEFRA, a statistician lady. And actually, for our international reporting obligations, we're going to have to increase our surveying of, of opium. So the map you're seeing on the left hand side there is showing where the sites were last year. We'll be redoing those sites. However, we've got to also increase it to well over 350 sites. So there's going to be a big body of work just planning that. And, and in fact, it's going to take some time. So um, uh, that map will be significantly different you know, by the end of the season. Um, and it'd be interesting to see what our observations are uh, going forwards. So we've got to essentially report that we have got no opium in these areas and this is important in terms of international plant trade because 
if opium is established, shall we say, in places like Newcastle, it's not the best free area. And actually, we then can't stop uh, legally. We're not uh, able to stop the importation of, of oak trees into this country. At, at present, uh, we've we, we introduced legislation after 2019 to stop the importation of instant oak trees to try to reduce the effect of uh, the spread of opium. A bit difficult to really explain this uh, easily, but the buffer zone um, is where we are doing the work to lessen the footprint of OPM. And that's changed significantly the boundaries, and it's going to have to change again soon, and I'll explain that in a moment. But the, the blue area outside the yellow line on the right hand side is actually the buffer zone, and it's quite a long geographical area. And then the inside, um, well, let's just go back. And the inside uh, of that line is what we call the established area. So in the buffer zone is where we issue these statutory notices. Those statutory notices actually are saying you've got to control OPM, but what we do is actually we pay for the control. Um, I think we've issued issuing around about 400 notices uh, this year. There might be a few more to come out, but. Um, we're just about there on what we'll be doing on the statute notice side of things. And then I mentioned about an offer in the established area to residential property. So we sent out, I think about, oh, was it 6,000 uh, communications to people, of which we got returns of over 1,400 uh, by email, over 700 phone calls. Um, the closing date for this offer was uh, well, it was the 21st. We, we knocked it back um, a few days to the 26th, and we had a phenomenal response. Over 2,000 uh, applications which were eligible, which we weren't able to offer everybody. Um, so we've just gone through an exercise, and so there's about seven 750 people have been offered uh, the opportunity to have control of their oak trees done in the residential situation. So this is the current situation of what we've been doing in the winter. And this is you know, rather a messy map, but it gives you an idea of how much work there is in looking for OPM. So worked again, worked with Sam from DEFRA Stats on a, a model as to where we should be targeting our observations of OPM. So this, this is this was done from well mid January through to where well, it's going to be running through to this coming Friday. And, and what was interesting about this is we were looking at areas where we didn't think OPM was present. If I go to the next slide though, you can see that the blue triangles here represent where we look for OPM, we couldn't find it. But there seems to have been quite a, an interesting spread going towards the Essex area, but also into Bedfordshire. And this is rather peculiar because there doesn't seem to have been a spread in the southwesterly direction. So what you're looking at here is, um, well, the, the, the M11 going up to Cambridge uh, around the Stansted Airport going across to Braintree. So really that's the A120, we found quite a bit of OPM, then linking back into London, obviously. But also we found some going up the M6, uh, M1 area, heading towards Milton Keynes, just south of Bedford. Um, and that again is a significant spread, which we weren't expecting to find. So it's, it's that's been, you know, uh, well, just a, a challenge as to what we will be doing there. It means, you know, in conversation with DEFRA policy colleagues, we will be changing the pest free area boundaries, or, or I, I suspect we will be changing the pest free area boundaries going forwards. There's one dot right to the north, which we can't explain. It seems to be a significant jump. We've done a phenomenal amount of survey work, but there's just this one point which we can't explain. It's a significant difference. Uh, distance from anywhere else. So we're doing you know, even more monitoring around that area in, in the coming season. So how do we control OPM? There's really two main methods. There's uh, there's actual physical remove, which is on the right hand side. That's where you can either remove the nest, put it into a bag and incinerate it, or you can use an industrial vacuum cleaner, the same type of 
pro uh, same type of machinery as you'd use if you're removing asbestos in, in those challenging situations. Or there's also the spraying of trees using, well, mostly a, a misting technique where an electric charge is put through the nozzle, then the mist gets attracted to, to the oak tree to, to help control the, the caterpillars. But there's also some natural predation of of opium. There's actually a specific parasitoid called Carcelia illica, which looks like a, a fly. Um, but we do seem to have observed this in its specific parasitoid of opium, and we do seem to be observing this spreading, you know, throughout the population of of, of known in areas of infestation of, of opium. And there's a lot of work going on on this, um, working closely with Newcastle University. Um, and we, we've actually had 43 reports observed of this fly by our professional surveyors. So the, it'd be interesting to know, you know what the distribution of this fly is. Newcastle are working on a diagnostic tool using DNA extraction and looking at opium nests to see whether we can find out how far this parasitoid has got to. So I said about um, you know, the effects of OPM, uh, it has these toxic hairs. So there was a picture of quite a few slides back now with these long wispy hairs. Those aren't actually the hairs which are a problem. There are microscopic barbed hairs, um, you know, tens of thousands on each caterpillar, which they can just release and, and has this effect of causing a rash on people. It's especially difficult for people in the occupational you know, working in oak trees like, you know, uh, tree surgeons doing maybe crown reduction work or surveyors, you're know, getting too close. So the pictures, the three pictures on the right hand side are do, to do with people who've actually been working, either surveying or you know, doing nest removal. But also it can affect people. The picture on the left hand side is where a lady's um, clothing got covered in opium on the washing line and then she got covered in head to toe in a rash. But also what's interesting is I was doing uh, some work with some um, contractors who were working on the network rail. So, so the network rail people were working, doing some uh, removal of oak trees in, infringing on the line um, about a month or so ago. And they dislodged the nest, an old nest, and they got affected by uh, rash. You can see the picture on the right hand side, the operator there, although they were wearing full protective equipment it's you know, still these hairs can can actually cause cause a rash so that's that, that was a challenge and also we see uh, there are effects on oak trees and this foliar feeding it, it creates like a skeleton of the leaf you can see the midrib of, of the, the leaf is left um, it just puts further stresses on the oak trees and and in localized situations can be quite dramatic I said about the you know, monitoring. So we, we deployed a lot of monitoring traps uh, last year. We're going to be doing even more this year. Um, and as I say, I'm also working with the Food and Environment Research Agency to look at using traps to maybe do mating disruption. So this is maybe another thing that will be able to help us control OPM. But um, it'd be interesting to know whether any people are in within this uh, conversation would, would like more information on trapping. But we've we've got some. Uh, you know, re resources we could point your way if, you, if you're interested in doing pheromone trapping. So that's, uh, you know, my half hour chat. I just wanted to say a big thank you to, you know, people who have supported the Forestry Commission over time. And uh, time for the Q&A now, uh, Millie, if that's OK. That's brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat. Millie has very kindly answered a great deal of them, but there's a, a few we'd just like to run through with you. Sure. Um, so the first one is, without control, would the moth spread to occupy the whole country? Uh, there's been some climate modelling done. We're, we're confident it would get to the Humber Mersey line. I'm unsure as to how far west it would go. My own observations are it doesn't seem to like the wet very much, um, but it, I mean, certainly with the climate changing, there's a, it, it will, it will certainly spread. And as I said, it's, it's spreading at roughly five miles, eight kilometres a year, which interestingly is less than has been observed in the Netherlands, where the spread seems to be 20 kilometres a year. I had a conversation very recently with uh, a person from, from Denmark. It hasn't yet reached 
reached Denmark and he confidently said, oh, it's going to be ages before it gets here. And it's 100 kilometers away from Denmark. And I, I suggested it could be there rather soon, uh, which took the wind out of their sails. But so it, it, it will be spreading. Um, we seem to have had less spread though, can we? Brilliant, thank you. Uh, next question is, what danger is there to other species when spraying? OK, so that's, a, that's a, a, an interesting question. So the product we use is, is something called Bacillus thuringiensis. It's what we call a biopesticide. It's actually one of the few, it's a naturally occurring product. It's actually ubiquitous within the soil. Um, it's one of the few products that the Soil Association will allow to be used for keeping one's organic soil status. That being said, the way that the product works is you spray it onto the leaves of the oak tree. The caterpillar eats the oak leaf and then essentially the biopesticide, the bacterium, um, disrupts the gut of the caterpillar and so it essentially starves to death. It is specific to Lepidoptera, so butterflies and moths. So it is moths and butterflies that are feeding at the same time on that tree. The product itself is very quickly degraded by UV and is also um, easily washed off. So it, it doesn't, it's not persistent within the environment, maybe two or three days. Okay, lovely. Um, next question, does OPM pose a serious threat to tree health? Uh, a, a serious threat. Um, I think it's it's difficult to give a concrete answer. That what we do know is it puts the trees under stress, and so is another stressor. So we have acute oak decline. Um, we have other stresses like uh, drought. Um, so it's another issue that is affecting the health of the trees. We're we're especially concerned on you know, veteran trees in that they you know, are being significantly affected by these stresses. So um, we haven't observed death of oak trees in this country. It has been observed in Germany um, and we are monitoring. Um, we do have some monitoring trials of the health of, of, of oak trees, you know, and links to opium defoliation. OK. Uh, next up is what do you think are the realistic prospects for eradication of OPM from the established and buffer zones? OK, so uh, I, 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 that's, uh, that's sorry, I obviously didn't make myself clear. The government policy is that OPM is established, so we cannot eradicate OPM from Britain. But there are areas of Britain which do not have OPM, what we call the pest free area. So that is where the policy is eradication. Where we have an established area, the established area or the buffer zone, we are we are we're just trying to manage opium, but the buffer zone will not be eradication, it will be managing, trying to slow the spread of opium. Okay. Um, next one we've got quite a few questions pinging in. Um, is there any particular type of site susceptible to OPM, so woodland or parkland, amenity or open field? So, so, OK, so our observations in this country, and, and interesting, this isn't observed by people in Hungary, but in, in our country, it does seem to be trees that are more open grown, so maybe in the parkland situation or at the edge of a ride side. We don't, we haven't noticed significant effects of OPM within the middle of a woodland context. So if if, if you are looking for opium, I would concentrate on ones which are in more sheltered positions, perhaps in sunnier areas or more open growth. OK, uh, next question. Are risks to health only in the caterpillar stage or or the moth as well? OK, so the moth itself isn't a problem. The risks are, yes, the caterpillars, but also the nests. So the nests, uh, you may recall I showed a picture of a gentleman who was working on network rail. There were no caterpillars there. That was just disturbing a nest and there was a lot of toxic hairs in the nest. So moths, no. Caterpillars, yes. Nests, yes. OK, lovely. Uh, does it affect other tree species? Not that we've we've never observed opium completing its life cycle on anything but oak quercus. Um, we have seen it on other trees, but that's when there's been significant defoliation and they're, they're exploring other avenues to try and find some more oak trees. So we've seen it on, for example, Scots pine. Um, 
and actually there was a conversation you uh, some oak trees aren't susceptible to opium but for example we've even found on corker quercus suba um, on holly oak um, quercus ilex so my advice is with the simple advice is oak trees yes you may see it on other trees but only if there's a very heavy population and it won't be completing its life cycle on those trees okay uh, so next question is in the buffer zone when you issue landowner notification is there a check to ensure they carry out the works okay so we actually do the work um, the, the mechanism to do the work is we issue the statutory notice so um, the check is that we do the work okay uh, why do the caterpillars travel in a procession yeah i th this is almost certainly a defense mechanism if, if you recall that slide there's one which merely took the picture of the single thread of, of opium so it actually just makes the caterpillar look a lot larger but when you saw the picture of them even wider that makes them even look more frightening shall we say and and, and the supposition is that this is just a you know, defense mechanism there's more of them um, it's a bit like, uh, you know, murmurations of starlings, you know, the more you get together, the less likely you, you're going to be uh, um, killed. So it's a defence mechanism. That's the that's the theory. OK, uh, next up is how effective is the bacillus control? Uh, it, it actually depends on um, whether it rains almost instantly afterwards, how windy it is. You can't spread if it's very windy, but actually, um, research has shown if, you, if, you've, if it's done correctly it's around about 80 to 90 percent effective one of the difficulties we have is actually getting the product all over the tree so oaks unfortunately can go quite large but the product we can only really get to about 20 maybe if we're lucky 25 meters where sometimes oak trees grow more than that so it's not going to be 100 percent effective but it will dampen the footprint of opium Great. Um, how certain are you that the 2019 outbreaks in the pest free area have been totally eradicated? Um, I'd like to say 100 <laughs> percent. <laughs> what I will say is we are doing extensive monitoring and we will keep on monitoring. At the moment, we haven't found anything. What is interesting is I talked about a site which we couldn't explain um, near Sandy in Bedfordshire. That's very close to where there was an interception in 2019. Um, so we've, we, we, are, we are not 100% sure as to why that one is there. It could be natural spread. It could have been linked to the 2019 in, um, uh, introductions. Um, pretty confident, but, but I'd be a fool to say I was 100% confident. OK, thank you. Uh, with the increase in number of surveillance sites, are there any roles available for regional volunteer surveyors around the country? Uh, we are, I, I am trialling some volunteers in the Kent area um, and there is a volunteer network called Observatory. I'm unsure whether Observatory are taking on new volunteers at the moment, but that's led by our forest research colleagues. I'm wondering, uh, Millie, whether we could just take that to one side, that, that thought and have a conversation uh, but th there is as far as I know not a, a network of volunteers for OPM across England. Okay thank you. Uh, how close are you to finding an effective mating disruption control solution and what is the application method such so as okay. traps or diffusers? Okay so we're just we, I've just started that conversation with um, Neil from the Food and Environment Research Agency. We're starting that experiment um, in the London area. We, we will be doing it by putting up pheromone traps uh, at a density, I can't recall, I'll have to speak to Neil to recall what density we'll be setting them up at. Um, but these research experiments do take some time. Essentially, we're getting baseline data this year. My suspicion is it's going to be around for two to five years this experiment to get an idea of what we need to do. And and there's also there's there's legislation there's there's legal uh, implications to this. So it's using a product which hasn't got the authorization to do so. We have to speak to the chemical regulations directive about this. Um, so so there's a number of hoops one has to 
to jump through before this can become a, a product that we could maybe um, authorise. OK, thank you. Uh, next question is, are there risk assessment examples available for forestry and ARB workers who may come into contact with OPM? Yeah, we can share. We've, we've got a generic uh, risk assessment. Again, really, could you just make a yeah, note of uh, that? Uh, and we can we can give you uh, well, what we use as our risk assessment and, and obviously more than willing to please use that. Next question. Um, do you have surveillance for pine procession remoth, although oh, it's not yet yes, present? Yes, yes. Uh, hot topic. Uh, we did have some pine procession remoth uh, found uh, recently, but again, this was on, on, on imported trees. That's being, uh, how can I put this? Uh, that's been eradicated. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure of that, but it's now generated more monitoring, but it's, it's, uh, it, pine procession moth is, is a significantly different beast in, in its life cycle is different. It's also much easier to see a pine procession moth. Um, so yes, we do uh, you know, look out for a pine procession moth, also with our animal and plant health agency colleague because they deal with the nursery trade. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so the fly parasite you were talking about earlier is non-native. Is that also a problem for other native wildlife? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think it is, Carol. I think it's specifically to, well, I've been led to believe it's specifically for OPM. So I suspect not, but I'm not, again, I, I'm not qualified to really answer that question. Okay, not a problem. Uh, what are the first or easiest signs we'll see in the woodland if the moth reaches us? Uh, oh, the easiest signs are observing nests it's especially at low levels of population but they're, they're really hard to see at low levels of population as i said the size of a nest could be the size of a golf ball and when, of course when they're in an exploratory phase there's actually much less of them it, I, sh I showed that picture of a, a, a white nest with that long silken trail it's never like that that's that that's you know for this presentation it's normally a grubby brown thing which is the same color as an oak tree um, so the best way is maybe to put some pheromone traps up um, before you think you're going to get OPM. So the reason why we found a lot of OPM nests, um, well, around near to the south of Bedford is we actually had a pheromone trap there which alerted us and we did some more investigation in there you know, this winter. So that's how it is. It's, it's looking for nests, but also maybe thinking about having a pheromone trap up beforehand. OK, brilliant. Uh, we'll just take a couple more questions because we're nearly out of time. Yes, um, yes, yes. So with the biochemical control, as it breaks down in a few days, does that also mean no bioaccumulation in the food chain once ingested? Yeah, so um, I'm not saying I'm going to do this, but um, it is specific to Lepidoptera um, in, uh, invertebrates. Mammalian, it, you can use it, it, it is licensed to be spread over watercourses, for example. Um, so, so yes, it does break down very quickly. That's, that's why we've chosen it for this control program. There is another product which is a broad spectrum insect cycle called Delta Methrin, but that, that kills on contact all invertebrates. OK, um, how serious is the rash to human health and how long does it persist? The campus is for a number of days going on for a week or so and different individuals have different reactions to it. There's been no evidence of anaphylaxis, but people can get a nasty rash. There was a picture of a lady on the left hand side. She had to take some time off work because of that. It's mostly an occupational health issue, but saying that you know, people do become affected by it. Um, a nasty rash. We haven't heard of any uh, deaths, let's put it that way. Okay. Um, are there still import issues or is it just movement within the country from the existing OPM population? OK, so we uh, there was legislation brought in place in late 2019 to stop the importation of trees, which could potentially be oversized to introduce OPM. And if you're in the buffer stroke established area, you're a nursery, you're not allowed to move oak trees from there. OK. Um, you've partially answered this because you've mentioned that you can use BT in yes. uh, on water treatment sites, but how would you recommend controlling OPM in an area where you cannot spray, such as protected habitats? Okay, uh, so really your options are to 
in mechanical removal, either using a vacuum and or physically removing the nest from the tree. And bagging them and, and uh, taking, uh, you know, either burying them on site or incinerating them. Fantastic. Um, final question. Are you doing any work with CABI, C-A-B-I, regarding biological control? Uh, not that I know of, no. OK, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time, Andrew. That's really helpful. That's okay. always, a, always a pleasure to host these updates. Uh, thank you, everyone who's attended. Um, you should be able to access this recording for a little while using the link that you've used to sign up today. Um, we'll also be uploading this presentation to the Forestry Commission YouTube channel and we'll look to get the slides distributed as well. So thank you everyone for all of your time and just a quick heads up as well if you're interested in Phytophthora pluvialis there is a webinar coming up on the 5th of April which is also on Eventbrite so if you do a search for that um, and if that's of interest to you as well that's coming up. Uh, other than that thank you everybody and we will hopefully see you all soon. Thank you.